Hello Set Apart Saints, this is David, and in this video I'm going to talk about the fulfillment of the fifth trumpet. If you're benefiting from the videos, please like them, make comments, and share them so that YouTube lists them for others to learn. Also, you can click on the bell next to the subscribe button if you want to be notified about new videos. If you want more information about the fulfillment of Revelation, the Revelation Timeline Decoded book provides it in detail, and I've included a link in the video description. This video series, like the chapters in my book, show how prophecy is fulfilled on a timeline. In the last video, we covered the iron clay feet of Daniel 2, 41, which says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. I showed how the miry clay points to the descendants of Ishmael, who was the result of Abraham mixing with the Egyptian handmaiden Hagar. I show how the word mixed and mingle point to the Arabs of Arabia. And I show the scripture in Genesis 21:20 says that Ishmael became a great archer, which comes into play in this fifth trumpet judgment. And I show that Satan used the Catholic bishops to help write the Quran and prop up Muhammad as the prophet to deceive Arabs with the false religion and that Satan is effectively Allah, the deceiver God that they revere. So that's where we're at on the timeline in regard to the explanation in the 6th century when the popes were given power. It only took 76 years for the Goths, Huns, Vandals, and Heruli of the first four trumpets to conquer the Western Roman Empire, which is why only seven verses were used to describe those attacks. The fifth and sixth trumpets give much more detailed information as the fulfillment time frames were much longer, 150 years and 391 years respectively. One third of the Roman Empire was lost to the barbarian invasions during the first four trumpets. One third will be attacked during the fifth trumpet judgment starting in 612 AD. The last third of the Roman Empire will be attacked during the sixth trumpet. Revelation 9, 1 to 2 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. It was Muhammad who opened the bottomless pit of Satan's lies when he spent time in the cave of Hera every year. In 610 AD, it said that Muhammad received his first revelation from the archangel Gabriel, which consisted of the first five verses of the Quran. The angel was no doubt a fallen angel or Satan himself, for 2 Corinthians 11:14 tells us, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Pagan superstition holds that caves serve as the seats of oracles and sources of inspiration. Scripture records the angel Gabriel's interaction with people, and he starts by reassuring them to remove their fear. He did this with Daniel, Zechariah, and Mary. But that's not what happened with Muhammad. While sleeping, he had a dream where he was pressed hard by an entity and commanded to read and recite what he had read. Muhammad's description of experiencing forcible pressure from an angel commanding him to recite is a graphic description of demonic oppression. Obviously, it was not Gabriel because he would not teach concepts that directly oppose Yah, the Heavenly Father's word, such as the son of Mary was a messenger of Allah. The Quran denies the deity of Messiah and says that he was just a prophet. It denies that he died on the cross and shed his blood for redemption. It says that he fainted or went unconscious on the cross and was brought around later and it denies the inerrancy of scripture. The falling star points to Muhammad, who lost his place as the leader of Mecca, and I covered that in the last video. It also points to Satan, who fell from heaven, who, out of his bottomless pit of lies, created Islam's false religion to deceive billions of people. In Vision of the Ages in the 19th century, Barton Johnson said, the star, or ruler of Mecca, held the key of the Kaaba, a kind of idol shrine, and the possession of that key in a family was significant of its princely power. The loss of the key had made Muhammad a fallen star. The key of the bottomless pit now given him not only restores him to the position of ruler of his own countrymen, but makes him a prince among the kings of the earth. The gospel of the Son of Righteousness, our Messiah, was darkened, hidden from the Arabs, as Islam's smoke blinded them from seeing the truth. Islamic nations have been held in bondage by the false doctrine of Islam for 1400 years, and to leave the religion to become a follower of Messiah is to be condemned to death. Their callous battle cry was, before you is paradise, but behind you is death and hell. That's sadly ironic, as Islam's false religion rose from the bottomless pit of hell, and belief in Islam condemns people to the second death in the fiery pit. The revelation Muhammad received that night was the first of many over the next 23 years that became the Quran, which means the recitation, as he merely recited what he was given. Each year during the month of Ramadan, he would withdraw from the world, and in the cave of Hera, three miles from Mecca, he consulted the spirit of fraud, 
or enthusiasm whose abode is not in the heaven, but in the mind of the prophet. The cave is called the Mountain of Light, or the Hill of Illumination. It's near Mecca in Saudi Arabia. It was a mountain of darkness as the blinding smoke of Islam's religion rose out of it, as a dark angel spoke the vision to Muhammad. This cave is aptly suggested to interpreters the idea of the pit of the abyss, whence the pestilential fumes and darkness were seen to issue. The smoke that arose is the false doctrine of the Quran, which covers the gospel of Messiah from the eyes of Arabs. The phrase, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, points to Muhammad, who said, I have been granted the keys of all treasures on earth. The term bottomless is Strong's Greek dictionary word, abusos, the source of our English word abyss. And where does Satan, the god of this earth, reside? In a cave, in an abyss where light doesn't shine. Muhammad's family had the key as guardians of the sacred black cobblestone in Mecca, but that key was given to another because Muhammad was too young to receive it when his grandfather died. Satan then offered him the key as the leader of Islam. In Hore Apocalypse by Edward Bishop Elliot, the Quran continually speaks of the key of God, which opened to them the gates of the world and of religion. So in the Quran, did God not give Muhammad the power of heaven, which is above, and fire, which is beneath? With the key, did he not give him the title and power of a porter, that he may open to those who he shall have chosen? In a book called Towards Understanding Islam, the author said, in that benighted era, there was a territory where darkness lay even heavier than elsewhere. They did not have a single educational institution or library. No one seemed interested in the cultivation and advancement of knowledge. A study of the remnants of their literature reveals how limited was their knowledge, how low is their standard of culture and civilization, how saturated were their minds with superstitions, how barbarous and ferocious were their thoughts and customs, and how decadent were their moral standards. There was no law except the law of the strongest. Loot, arson, and murder of innocent and weak people was the order of the day. Whatever notions they had of morals, culture, and civilization were primitive in the extreme. They could hardly discriminate between pure and impure, lawful and unlawful. Their lives were barbaric. They reveled in adultery, gambling, and drinking. Looting and murder were part of their everyday existence. As regards their religious beliefs, they worshipped stones, trees, idols, stars, and spirits. Regarding Muhammad, he said, he is completely illiterate and unschooled. He never gets a chance to sit in the company of learned men, for such men were non-existent in Arabia. He tells his readers that Muhammad and his message came out of Arabia, out of the abyss of the darkness. Isn't that interesting? From that description, we see the environment that Muhammad lived in, as it was a bottomless pit of barbarianism. And we see that he was completely uneducated and ripe to be misled by knowledgeable people. What a perfect person to use, as he no doubt wanted to control Mecca very badly. Satan gave it back to him, and he was propped up as the great prophet that came out of the dark abyss of Arabia. As we saw in the last video, a lot of Hebrew words are Arab in the Hebrew language. And word 5150, Arab, means to be darkened. And we can see how Islam, which rose from the abyss, has darkened the world. In scripture, error and evil are symbolized by darkness, truth by light. Islam fosters all the carnal, human heart's wicked passions, such as war, murder, slavery, and lust. Indeed, it's from the bottomless pit of Satan's wicked mind. The bishops of Rome created the perfect way to deceive many people with false religion and use their beliefs to carry out the Pope's agenda. In the last prophecy, Edward Bishop Elliot says, As the natural light of the sun is a fit emblem of the spiritual illumination that comes down from God and Father of lights, so may we infer that whatever is described as darkening the atmosphere, even as smoke from a pit, must be meant in the opposite sense of a moral or spiritual pollution. The deadly evil of Muhammad and his Quran came out from Arabia at the very time we speak of, with the creed, the invention of fanaticism and fraud. In its system, the blessed God is described as cruel and unholy, and in his morals, pride, ferocity, superstition, and sensuality are held up for admiration and show palpably whence it had its origin. In a short history of the Near East, William Davis said about Muhammad, At that juncture, however, like a meteor from the blue, came into the world a new religion, a religion primarily of power and not of love, a militant fanaticism appealing to the evil which lies in men, and only partly to the good. Edward Gibbon, Roman historian who wrote the history and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, pointed to how Islam gave the Arabs a great cause. The Arabs had languished in poverty and contempt till Muhammad breathed into those savage hordes the soul of enthusiasm. Muhammad was alike instructed to preach and to fight, 
and the union of these opposite qualities contributed to his success. His voice invited the Arabs to freedom and victory, to arms and rapine, to the indulgence of their darling passions in this world and the next. The temper of a people thus armed against mankind was doubtly inflamed by the domestic license of rapine, murder, and revenge. The book Paraphrase of the Revelation of St. John, according to E.B. Eliot in the 19th century, said, and by the invention of a false religion of hellish origin, from beginning to end a lie, in its pretensions superseding the gospel of the Lord Jesus, in its doctrines inculcating views of the blessed God, dark, cruel, and unholy, and its morals a system of pride, ferocity, superstition, and sensualism. He opened the bottomless pit, and its false religion rose suddenly into eminence, and was seen as if there was a pestilent smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and, and the imperial sun and the air or moral atmosphere were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Revelation 9.3 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Literal locusts came from the east. From Arabia. We see in Exodus 10:13, and Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. Scripture also defines that locusts represent Arabians. Judges 6, 5 says, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as the grasshoppers. And the Hebrew word there can be locust for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Judges 7.12 says, Now the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, and as the sand by the seashore in multitude. In describing the Ninevites, Nahum 3.15 refers to them as locusts. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself as the locust. The scorpion is of the same native locality as we see Moses reminding the Israelites of Yah's goodness to them throughout the 40-year wanderings. In Deuteronomy 8.15 he says, Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. Recall from the last video that Strong's Hebrew word for nation is Gawi, which means a Gentile, heathen nation, people. The nation of Islam is a heathen troop of animals, a flight of locusts. In the Arabian poem, The Romance of Antar, locusts were introduced as the national emblem of the Ishmaelites. I shall command these armies, numerous as the locusts, to assault you and to grind you like grain and ride you like lions. Mohammedan tradition speaks of locusts having dropped into the hands of Muhammad, bearing on their wings this inscription, We are the army of the great God. Niber, a famous traveler of the 19th century, journeying through Arabia, described the appearance of the swarms of locusts that afflicted the region. The swarms of these insects darkened the air and appeared at a distance like clouds of smoke. So we see the symbolism that's being used to describe the Arabs in the fifth trumpet judgment. Nothing would better represent the numbers of the Saracenic hordes that came out of Arabia, who spread over Egypt, Libya, Mauritania, Spain, and that threatened to spread over Europe than such an army of locusts. The religion of Islam became the motivating force that inspired the Arabs to go on their mission of devastation. In the Caliphate, its rise, decline, and fall in the 19th century, William Murr says, Like swarms from a beehive, or like locusts darkening the air, the one Arabian tribe after the other emerged and rolled into the north, and then spread out into the great hordes and to the east and to the west. Thus the Arab Muslims then almost totally wiped out the Christian church, all the way from northern India to northwest Africa. Onward and still onward, like swarms from the hive, or flights of locusts darkening the land, tribe after tribe issued forth, and hastening northward, spread in great masses to the east and to the west. In the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, Edward Upper says, The Persian Empire soon attracted the arms of these locusts, as the swarms of Saracens were not inaptly called. An essay on language, William Samuel Cardell in the 19th century, says in the 7th century, an extraordinary individual founded a religion system, which was overspreading the fairest portion of the earth. The Mohammedan banners were everywhere displayed, and the Saracens, like the locusts of a former age, overspread the land. And I don't believe those two people were believers. I think they're just historians, but they're using the language which confirms the fulfillment of the fifth trumpet. In History of Latin Christianity, Henry Hart Millman says, In a passage in a latter letter to Count Boso, the Pope describes the Saracens as an army of locusts, turning the whole land into a wilderness. Extensive regions were so desolate as to be inhabited only by wild beasts. Revelation 9.4 says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. 
but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, when real locusts invade a land, all vegetation is devoured. So obviously, these locusts aren't literal, but symbolic. During his life, Muhammad gave various injunctions to his forces and adopted Islamic military jurisprudence practices towards war. His companion and first caliph declared, Bring no harm to the trees, nor burn them with fire, especially those which were fruitful. That is a perfect match. Unlike the Goths of the previous trumpet judgment, who had a scorched earth policy of burning everything up, Mohammedans were commanded not to harm the trees or the fields so they could take them over and prosper from them. In the last prophecy, Edward Bishop Elliot says, The command did not destroy the palm trees or fields of corn or fruit trees was a dictate of policy, not of mercy, for by following this plan, the Saracens had, soon after the conquest, formed flourishing countries round them. It was a marked peculiarity, for as in other invasions as the Gothic, fire, sword, and devastation tracked the invaders' progress and was accordingly prefigured in the apocalyptic imagery. But with the Saracens, it was the very reverse, and its reverse still more connected with the prediction now before us. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's successor, declared, You will meet religious people living in recluse cloisters. Leave them alone. Do not kill them. You shall meet another sort of people who belong to the school of Satan, who have their heads shorn as a crown, a tonsure, split their skulls without mercy, unless they become Muslims or pay tribute. They wore their hair long and disheveled, and shaved their heads when they were ordained priests. The circular tonsure was sacred and mysterious. It was the crown of thorns, but it was likewise a royal diadem, and every priest was a king. So here we have another match, as the command is to leave Catholic monks alone, but to attack orthodox christians the tonsure is a practice of cutting or shaving some or all of the hair on the scalp is a sign of religious devotion or humility the muslims encountered tonsures orthodox christians the idolaters and saint worshippers of the eastern roman empire who were not sealed with the holy spirit this was done out of vengeance from the antiquarian peace popes of rome against people who proclaim that he is not their leader the bigger picture is that yah the heavenly father used the muslims of islam as a scourge and punishment on those who did not have his seal on their foreheads Revelation 9.5 says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Literal locusts come out for five months from April to September. Using the year for a day principle, five months points to 150 years. Five months times 30 days is 150 years. In 632, Muhammad died, and the Arabs moved out of Arabia to conquer other lands. This was the time of the supremacy of Islamic power, and for 150 years they conquered Arabia, Palestine, Syria, Egypt, Spain, and North Africa. They moved north, east, and west to Armenia, Cyprus, Crete, Syria, Persia, Kazakhstan, Babylonia, Sardinia, Corsica, and France. The great Charles Martel, called the Hammer, finally stopped them in 732 AD at the Battle of Tours in northern France. In Hore Apocalypse, Edward Bishop Elliot says, In ten years the Saracens had reduced to his obedience 36,000 cities or castles, destroyed 4,000 churches, and built 1,400 mosques for the exercise of the religion of Muhammad. In 762 AD, Caliph built Baghdad as the empire's future seat and called it the City of Peace. The Saracens no longer made rapid conquests, but only engaged in ordinary wars like other nations. In 782 AD, they signed the Treaty of Constantinople, which brought peace. The five months, 150 years, were fulfilled from 632 to 782 AD. In notes on the Handbook of Revelation, Albert Barnes says, It should be added also that in the year 762, the Caliph built Baghdad and made it the capital of the Saracen Empire. Henceforth, that became the seat of Arabic learning, luxury and power, and the wealth and talent of the Saracen Empire were gradually drawn to that capital, and they ceased to vex and annoy the Christian world. Revelation 9.6 says, And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. The Mohammedans were not allowed to eradicate the apostate Christians. They gave them a choice, convert to be a Muslim, be killed if they decide to challenge them, or agree to be second-class citizens and pay tax to the Muslims. If a Muslim came to the door, they had to bring them in and feed them. Many didn't have the spirit of Yah to accept martyrdom for their faith. They chose to become second-class citizens who were subservient to the Muslims. They sought death but couldn't find it because they had not the nerve to fight. Revelation 9-7 says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. The nomadic Bedouin people prized the Arabian horse, often being brought inside the family tent for shelter and theft protection. More than any other people group, the horse fills up their poetry, art, and romantic legends. 
the arabian breed has great capacity in sustaining speed over great distances while requiring less food and water than other horses making it the perfect war horse for the arabs in the desert the arab warriors issuing from arabia with their great speed far-ranging and irresistible progress were fittingly symbolized by locust swarms likened to horses prepared for battle the self-portrait of antar who was a contemporary of muhammad gives us a visual of the fulfillment he is on a horse which is prepared for battle the, the crowns of gold represent the gold and yellow saffron colored turbans that they wore they had faces as the faces of men because they had beards which is a sign of their masculinity romans and other races shaved their faces so this would have stood out to john in the arabian tale antar it is written that god intended for the arabs that their turbans should be unto them instead of diadems crowns ezekiel twenty three forty two says and a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her and with the men of the common sort were brought sabians arabs from the wilderness which put on bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads revelation nine eight says and they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions antar also refers to shoulder-length hair and turbans on arab men he says in his poem he adjusted himself properly twisting his whiskers and folded up his hair so he had long hair like a woman under his turban drawing it off his shoulders in natural history pliny the elder in the first century the apostle john's contemporary spoke of the turbaned arabs with their uncut hair the muslim warriors had long hair like women which when they were preparing for battle they would tie up under the turbans and their teeth whereas the teeth of lion means that they were savage and ferocious joel one six points to the assyrians who were fierce as a great lion for a nation has come up upon my land strong and without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and he had the cheek teeth of a great lion in describing arabia isaiah thirty six says the land of trouble and anguish from whence came the young and old lion the viper and fiery flying serpent they will carry their riches upon their shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them in antar a bedouin romance it says but i must assail you without further preparation and i shall command these armies numerous as the locusts to assault you and to grind you like grain and to ride you like lions the esteemed roman empire historian edward gibbon documented the intrepid souls of the arabs were fired with enthusiasm the death which they had always despised became an object of hope and desire the first companions of muhammad advanced to the battle with a fierceless confidence there is no danger where there is no chance they were ordained to perish in their beds and they were safe and invulnerable amidst the darts of the enemy the patriarch of constantinople observed that the saracens fought with the courage of lions the sword says muhammad is the key of heaven and of hell a drop of blood shed in the cause of god a night spent in arms is of more avail than two months of fasting and prayer whoever falls in battle his sins are forgiven seventy-two black-eyed girls of resplendent beauty blooming youth virgin purity and exquisite sensibility will be created for the use of the meanest believer a moment of pleasure will be prolonged to a thousand years and his faculties will be increased a hundredfold to render him worthy of his felicity in Hore apocalypse edward bishop elliot records who said muhammad after announcing his mission will be my lieutenant o prophet replied ally i am the man whoever rises against thee i will dash out his teeth tear out his eyes break his legs rip open his belly o prophet i will be thy viciar revelation nine nine says and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses the arab army wore chainmail breastplates of iron as they went into battle muhammad in the quran says god has given you coats of mail to defend you in your wars so we see a perfect match in the battle of ohud the second battle that muhammad fought with the Quraysh of mecca seven hundred were armed with cuirasses breastplates of iron in notes on the handbook of revelation albert barnes says in the poem antar the steel and iron cuirasses of the arab warriors are frequently noticed a warrior immersed in steel armor fifteen thousand men armed with cuirasses and well accoutred for war they were clothed in iron armor and brilliant cuirasses out of the dust appeared horsemen clad in iron the sound of their wings represent the rapid conquest of the saracens as they moved over countries as swiftly as locusts their many horses causing a great sound adam clark noted that the horse and rider were as one being the arabs are the most expert horsemen in the world they live so much on horseback that the horse and his rider seem to make but one animal revelation nine ten says and they had tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months the bible notes that ishmael was an archer 
and his descendants mastered the skill. So we see the direct correlation of being an archer with this fulfillment right here. The Saracens were excellent horsemen and archers, and they had the unique ability to fight rearwards, shooting arrows backwards with precision while at full gallop. Thus, there were stings in their tails. Edward Gibbon says, I shall here observe what I must often repeat, that the charge of the Arabs was not like that of the Greeks and Romans, the effort of a firm and compact infantry. Their military force was chiefly formed of cavalry and archers. Revelation 9.11 says, And they had a king over them which is the king of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath the name Apollyon. Proverbs thirty twenty seven says, The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. Muhammad has not been referred to as a king. The fallen angel of the bottomless pit is Satan. Abaddon and Apollyon are words that essentially mean destroyer, or one who exterminates, which is what Satan does. Allah, Satan, the destroying angel, is the king over Islam. Revelation 9.12 says, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. The fulfillment of the fifth trumpet prophecy is one of the most vivid in Revelation, as we can see that all the Arabian references were pointing to the rise of Islam and the Mohammedan army, who were sent to attack apostate Christians. In the ninth century, Arabian caliphs began employing Turkish soldiers as mercenaries. The Turkish leaders gained authority, and they were used to attack the Eastern Roman Empire. In the next video, I'll show you the fulfillment of the Sixth Trumpet Judgment featuring the Turkish leaders. That's all for today. I love y'all. Shalom.